Hello, Facundo. Hey, how, how are you doing? Yes, yes, I'm really happy to uh, to be talking to you today. Thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure for me too. So, um, I think a lot of people uh, that have us friends on Facebook uh, know you, but uh, still, I would like to ask: uh, Can you give me a short introduction of uh, who you are for those who don't uh, were not familiar with you? Um, okay, my my name is Facundo Lazzari. Uh, I am a bandoneon player. I think everyone that could know me from Facebook knows knows me from La Juan D'Arienzo. Um, I was playing bandoneon the last, I don't know, 17, 18 years. And I found it uh, with one of my colleagues, Ricardo Badaraco. We founded La Juan D'Arienzo uh, about 10 years ago. So uh, I just gave my life to tango and La Juan D'Arienzo was the project we were uh, working on all this time. And uh, just one improvised question. Uh, do you also dance? I don't know if I will use that word because okay. it's too much, you know. Yeah, yeah, I dance, but not so much. Uh, I, I don't think of myself as a good dancer, you know, but I, I like to dance, yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we'll hear more about that uh, in the interview, but uh, let's just begin uh, in the beginning. So can you tell me something about your childhood, about uh, how you grew up? You know, I... Uh, I grew up in Buenos Aires. I am from Buenos Aires. Um, I'm 36 years old for now. And uh, I didn't used to listen to tango music when I was a child. My parents didn't listen to tango. I got this from my grandfather uh, when I was 19 years old. So uh, I started to listen to tango when I was about 18 years old. And after one year of listening to Darienzo, I started to to play bandoneon. Before, I mean, in my childhood, I I didn't have any contact with uh, any instrument and and tango music. I I remember I really loved music and I really liked to sing, but I was always listening to rock and roll and this kind of uh, music. Like now, I mean, I still listen uh, this music, uh, but they were normally uh, Argentinian rock. Uh, what what I was listening. But then I found tango uh, when I was an adult. Uh, I was already 19 and and I got this this path of tango and I started to play bandoneon and okay, I, I made this my life. How did you find tango music? It's a funny story, I think, because uh, as I told you, I didn't have any contact with tango. I knew my grandfather was a bandoneon player, but it was just that. It was not a wonderful, crazy, or great bandoneon player for me because I did not know anything about tango. So I didn't have like the 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 measure of who was this guy. You know, he was a, such a good bandoneon player. Uh, so when I was this age, like 17, 18 years old, I used to write a lot of poems, poetry, uh, trying to write lyrics, you know, for, I don't know, I don't know why, but I, I really like it to, to write this. So I wrote something to my mom and she liked it so much. So you know how moms are sometimes. She, uh, she got the book I had with all my lyrics and she thought that maybe if uh, my grandfather wants to put some music to one of my lyrics, we could do a, a tango together and I can get a, a medical insurance <laughs> because of the rights of the music. You know? Such a mom's idea. <laughs> so she stole my lyrics and gave it to my grandfather. Uh, and my grandfather was so respectful with me. He said, it is not so bad. <laughs> It was really bad, you know, it was not tango at all. It was some fantasy things of a teenager, you know. But he said, if you would like to to write the tango, you need to listen tango music. So I, I came back home and I started to listen Juan D'Arienzo. Uh, and after that, I just fell in love with, with Bandoneon and, and the music. And I asked him if he could teach me Bandoneon. But after one year, I was one year listening to tango and trying to write lyrics and going to his house, my grandfather, and and 
show in the, the poetry I was writing, and he say always like, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> he didn't like it, this. But I, after a while, I, I just fell in love with the sound of bandonio. So in Juan D'Arienzo, there is something that is so characteristic from our side, that is the variaciones. You know, when the bandonios play so fast, tiki 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 tiki. So I remember I was always uh, at night studying something because I finished high school at this moment, so I was a student things I like, listening to music, and I was listening to Led Zeppelin, and then Juan D'Arienzo, and then Bob Marley, and then Juan D'Arienzo again, you know, and this kind of mixing music. Uh, and the variaciones of my grandfather were always like, wow, this this could be uh, like Jimmy Page doing something so hard, you know, it is exactly the same. I mean, it's so hard. How they do this, you know? And after one song, it was Led Zeppelin. I said, how this guy do this? You know, like, was the same feeling. Uh, so I, I fell in love with, with Bandonian and, and I got into into tango because of this accident. <laughs> yes. Um, so I'm just wondering, so it's strange to me that, so let's talk a bit more about your grandfather uh, after this question, but it's strange to me that you can be from such a family and then the generations are just not connected with each other. Like your grandfather was just doing his thing, but then his daughter uh, or your father, I mean, I don't know whose yeah. side it was, my, but... Yeah, my father. Yes. Uh, they are not connected to that. And you are uh, you are like a, a porteño. You don't really know about tango either. I mean, it's so crazy to me sometimes how that can exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was... It was, I am the only one from the family, from eight uh, grandchildren my grandfather had, the only one that get into tango, I mean, that felt interested in, in him and his work, you know? It was a, 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 such an accidental thing of life. It, it was not because I had any, I don't know, I, it was not mandatory. I just decided to do it. I was grown, I mean, I, mean, I was not a child. Uh, but I think it was, I, I think not, not just in Argentina, but everywhere in the Western world. I, I think in the 60s were the huge break between the generation of my parents and my grandparents. So they, they just started to do all, all the opposite things. And tango was in this equation, you know, like tango started to be from 60s and 70s, the music of the old people, because they started to listen to tango, uh, not tango, like rock and roll and this. So TV shows and everything started to be focused on young generations and tango started to disappear. Um, I don't know. So this is why my parents didn't listen to any tango. When they were children, they were like pushed to listen to the music of their parents. Oh. When they grew, they decided to listen to their own music and, and they found it normally in rock or disco music in the 70s. Uh, so my grandfather, he was not a person. He was, uh, he was not a like, a, how to say, like a egocentric person. You know, he was not uh, showing to everyone he was a great person, a great musician, like having this credit of you know what I did or something like this. He was so humble. So actually, I just saw saw him for the very first time playing when he. When I was playing bandone, we never see him playing bandone. Okay. Not at home, not in birth. Oh, that's so that's so crazy in a way. I mean, yeah. maybe it's natural, but for me, it just feels like something strange that it's yeah. so... But maybe it's because he was humble and didn't want to force yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. He didn't like this uh, to, I don't know, to show himself to everyone. Look what amazing I am. You know, he, he didn't do that. Uh, I don't know because this was all his life. It was not when I when I uh, started to to study. I mean, he was so old at this time. But when he was young, it was the same. I mean, he was not going to play bandoneon in a birthday party or something like this with my family, like you know, intimate. Uh, I don't know why, but it was like that. So nobody knew anything about this guy. <laughs> it was. He was our grandfather, but he was not a musician, not a great bandoneonist. He was not an author. He was not a composer. He was the grandfather. It's just that, you know. Uh, so I, I found, I had a grandfather, and on him I found 
a friend, I found I found a, a teacher, I found a colleague, I found a lot of things, you know, finally in this person. It was kind of, uh, I don't know, super wise person for me because he was so old and I was so young and we used to fight a lot because yes. I was, yes, I was 20 years old. He was 80 years old, you know, like just two different words in our minds, you know, so we, and I, and I was not, uh, I think I didn't respect so much uh, him just because it was him. It was my grandfather, so I was, I had a lot of confidence to, I don't know, to contradict him or, or think different, you know? And he was like, it was so hard for him <laughs> to bear me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's also love, right? Mm, yeah. yeah. I, I miss him so much. Yeah. So, because he died, um, what year? 2009, 2010? He died in 2009. Okay. Yeah. And you started in 2008. I started to play with him in 2008 uh, in Juan Darín's orchestra. Uh, I started to study with him in 2006. So after two years, I started to play with him. And I played with him the last year of his life. Uh, and after that, I started to play with the musicians from his work, uh, his orchestra. We make a quartet. Uh, and I and I continue learning a lot about the style with his colleagues, you know, the piano player, double bass player. They were wonderful friends of him. And my friends too. Uh, they were two uh, like grown people, old people, like 70, 80 years old. So I got a lot of uh, knowledge from them they, during these years. It was actually really nice to share. Okay, um, let's return to that later. Um, let's now just return to the question. Um, who was your grandfather? Just for people who are not that familiar with the music, uh, the, the history of musicians. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what what did he do? He was uh, Carlos Lazari, my grandfather. He plays bandoneon, and uh, he played twenty five years with uh, Juan Darienzo since nineteen fifty to nineteen seventy six, and after that he continued doing Juan Darienzo style uh, with the quartet, Los Solistas de Darienzo. They were so famous in seventies and eighties here, and. And then with Orchestra Juan Darienzo to do big trips to, to overseas like Japan, Europe. Uh, but my grandfather, before to play with Juan Darienzo in 1950, he already played with Canaro, with Caló, with Maderna. Uh, he was playing in the best orchestras uh, in the 40s uh, when he was like 15 years old. Like he was actually really young when he started to play with Caló. It was, it was funny because, you know, well, sorry, in the what, 40s, what? What year did he start? Do you know that? He started to play professionally with Miguel Caló when he was about 15 years old. I'm talking about the 1940, something like this. Okay. Hmm. So at this moment, the orchestras used to play in cabarets, you know? So uh, my grandfather was 15 years old. He was not un uh, underage. So... Uh, he couldn't go there. So he played very well at 15 years old. He was already conducting a, an orchestra in his neighborhood, like a children's orchestra, these kind of things. Uh, he was called to to play with a, a professional orchestra for money, you know, it was money involved there. And uh, he got just one order from the conductor. And he was, if the police come in, you have to hide yourself under the stage. I mean, it was not important how he played. He was a child, you know, but the police can't have can't find you here with short pants, you know. You are you are underage, so you you can be here. So he started to play there, and and then he didn't stop. He was playing with many orchestras. My grandfather composed about close to eight hundred or a thousand tangos. I mean, there are, there are many 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 tangos of my uh, grandfather and. Many of them were recorded for Juan D'Arienzo, but other orchestras too, like Pisali or Pugliese, recorded some some things from my grandfather. And so within the orchestra, uh, was he the lead Panonion player in D'Arienzo? Uh... When he started to play, no. Uh, in 1950, uh, 
he was already Salamanca in the orchestra, and the first bandoneon it was uh, Eladio Blanco, I think, at this moment. Uh, and he was so young. My grandfather was 25 years old when he came to the orchestra. Juan Darien's orchestra was the most popular orchestra in Argentina at this moment. So uh, to get into that, it was so important for him. It's like, you know, if you are a football player and you get a contract with Real Madrid, something like this, you know, it's like going to the best thing you can you can find in the market. Uh, but of course, there were older people than him working from before. So he was not... Uh, getting the orchestra as a conductor at all. But after some years, close to 60s, he started to be the arranger of the orchestra. Mm. So many of the arrangements from 57, when Salamanca made his own orchestra, 57 to 76 are my grandfather music when he used to write. At this moment, he was, uh, he had to uh, write a new tango or a new arrangement every week. So this was uh, his job, like a new tango every week, every, a new song every week. So it was the whole day, like with the instrument and composing. And it was, this is what my father remembered, you know, because I was not there. Like it was the whole day working so hard. Uh, at home? Yeah. Yeah, that's why your father saw it probably. Yeah. 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 Uh, at home, but in this moment, there were the... There was a lot of uh, work in tango. So at night, they used to play like two or three times. Sometimes finish the milonga and go to the radio to, to play there and come back home like midday <laughs> to sleep. You know, like it was so normal, this kind of like, like backwards uh, because it was so popular tango. So there were many cabarets with music every night. So uh, he used to work a lot. But during the day, he had to find time to write music too. So it was the whole day. Uh, working on music yeah just like you yes 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 we try to do the same uh, but we we dedicate a lot, a lot of time to things that are actually not related ah uh, yes to, yes to, yes know, like be the manager or being the community manager and i don't know making a flyer for facebook you know there, there are things they they are not going to do in their lives but we have to do because it this is 2024 we, we have to do Yes. Yeah. yeah, so that's that's one of the topics we're going to talk about today. I think that's really interesting. A lot of people don't really know that probably. But yeah, back then uh there were different times. So it's kind of a maybe a stupid question for someone who's a musician like you for me to ask. But for example, if I think of uh, Darienzo from the late 50s or maybe early 60s, like uh, El Ultimo Café. Um, so for example, he he, he could have made the arrangement for that, the way Darienzo played that song. Mm -hmm. no, my grandfather, yeah. Yeah, so so for example, if I think of a Darienzo from those years, uh, it's it's quite possible that uh, that he wrote the arrangement for the Darienzo version. Yeah, yeah. Because that's what it comes down to, right? Like you have a song, and it was usually uh, a popular song at the moment, and then an orchestra picked it up. And they wrote their own arrangement. So that's that's what your grandfather yeah. did, for example. Yeah, yeah. He had to do this or a new song. Oh, yeah. I mean, this was the, the the mandatory for him. So when he if he didn't have a new song, he took another song, like from I don't know, something that maybe Piazzo uh Pugliese or, or Piazzolo or whatever, it's not important who played and recorded and he made an arrangement for Juan Darien, so like El Ultimo Café or Hasta Siempre Amor. But there, yeah, there yeah. are some little things I can listen about the arrangement that I, I feel, okay, this is my grandfather. Oh, know? that's and, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some the endings from the 60s are, are, are like so, chan, 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 chan. This is so Lazarus, you know? <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> he used to have it in a lot of his songs, same patterns. You know? Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, I've, I guess I can ask more about that, but let's just focus on um, on your own uh, history. So you told us that you uh, began studying bandoneon, and then you um, you pretty much asked your your grandfather, "Can you teach me?" And then yeah. you started learning with him. So let, let's uh, 
Yeah. Yes, he got a he got a bandonion for me from one of his students. At this moment, he had a lot of a lot of students at home, and and I just came home and started to play this like it was a huge machine, um, and it was I I found in the in taking lessons with him a, a wonderful challenge to go every week there, and and show him I could do it. I really think at the beginning my grandfather didn't have any. He didn't trust I, I was going to like continue doing that because it is so normal when we are young that you start something today and I don't know, like you go to the gym and after 15 days, you, you already forgot you were a member of a gym, you know, and you change and you are playing guitar. And after two months, you are learning uh, Chinese and you are young. And he's, yeah. I think he thought, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think he thought uh, I was not going to. I was going to get so bored, so so easy, so fast, uh, <clears throat> because it's so hard at the beginning. The instrument bandoneon is so hard. The first months, you you, you are, it's so hard to play anything. In yes. The first month. I tried it too when I was uh, nineteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I, I didn't. Did uh, I, I didn't uh, go through with it. So. Yeah, at the beginning it it, it could be so hard. Uh, then when you start did, to. Did you... You you didn't know anything about music, right? About like uh, reading music about. No, no. Oh, it's so hard. Like I had the same as you. It's so hard if you know nothing. I remember the first lesson I took with him. He told me, "Do you know how to read music?" And I said, "Of course." You know, I I didn't want to say no, <laughs> but I knew it was this five lines, and in the middle, uh, it was a she. I was wrong because it is a B, you know. Uh, so I came back home and I started to study everything in in a wrong. <laughs> I mean, huh. I started to, to find the scales in a, in a in a wrong way because I didn't know how to how to read. So the following week I came back and I say I play and he said, "What are you doing?" You know, I say this is not like this. I mean, this line is she. No, this is B. Oh, okay, <laughs> everything is wrong. <laughs> yeah. So I had to start again. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I really didn't know anything uh, theory, uh, harmony. I didn't know anything, uh, and this made it so hard at the beginning. Uh, but the same uh, after one year, I was playing Bach in in Bandoni. Uh, wow! It it was so. I really spent a lot of hours uh, playing scales, playing every this method called Ambrose. I was playing all the the exercise every day, like every week new exercise so i was uh working really hard when i when i started to play bach it was like wow okay this i i really want to do this this is i i can do something so beautiful and so complex and so i felt so proud about this this uh achievement uh so i didn't stop i couldn't stop it was <laughs> so nice <laughs> Yes. Um, sorry for the very specific questions, but um, I would like to know what did you like so much about the bandoneon? Like before you even started, uh, you chose it, right? And so why? Yeah. Uh, I remember hearing Juan D'Arienzo and the power of the instrument, uh, the uh, the variaciones and the power of the instruments. The, the variations were something that I felt if if I can play this I am I'm the best you know I don't know why I had this idea but this is like being Jimmy Page in in a band on you you know like if you play variations uh, I could play guitar too but I, I don't know I had my grandfather and I was listening that answer. I felt when I started to listen tango when I was yes 18 years old I I felt I was uh, like an adult, I was listening to tango music, you know, I felt this was so serious. I, uh, my mom told me many times, like, uh, she was walking through my room and she listened tango and thought, thinking uh, herself, you know, like, uh, what is this guy doing? You know, like, why is he listening to tango music? <laughs> and I was so listening to tango, reading books, you know, I felt so smart. I don't know why. So snob, you know, like, it was really, really, really nice. Uh, 
but it was the sound of bandonian the powerful of the instrument the power that they, they it, you can rah, open this and make like an explosion that took me uh, and, and made me feel maybe i can try at least try you know and and then i just fell in love you know there is not a lot of logic there <laughs> yeah and so yeah go ahead when when i started to study bandonian i started to study history at the university too and I, I still study history. Uh, I maybe one day I will get my degree, you know. <laughs> but I dedicated my life to to music. And I had a teacher, and she was asking to everyone to make a short introduction about themselves. So I said I study history and I play bandonian. And and she told she told me, oh, you really like money, right? <laughs> like it, it it's like choosing two things that you are not going to maybe you don't yeah okay yeah 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 it's hard yeah 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 yeah, yeah. in a, an ironic way like yeah you really like money right oh uh, <laughs> you know yes it's true i, I don't have future <laughs> i'm going to be a musician and a history teacher you know like but it, they were just the things that i felt passion for yeah so yeah. that's Bandonian good was was that it was just a passion i, I just developed and and I don't know, now I'm 36 years old and I think it's the only thing that I found in life that it was always loyal to me. I mean, if I put my time, my energy there, it always gives me something back. My bandone is, is always there for me. So I don't know. It's, it's a relationship that is uh, magical. <laughs> yes, that's beautifully uh, said. Um. Can you answer the same question about tango music itself? Do you have any idea? Maybe you you, you were talked. You said one thing about the uh, the the variaciones, the variations. Yeah. But what else? Because um, it's quite to me. I'm asking that because it's quite interesting to me that you're like two generations later and you like something a lot that's old, and yeah. you're not the only one who has had. I mean, I'm also like I'm a few years younger than you. I had the same thing happen to me that I just like tango music. Uh, it cannot always be explained into words, but why do you think it? Uh, yeah. Any idea? You no, know, tango, tango music. It's. I am I am Argentinian and I am from Buenos Aires, Porteño, you know. And, yes. Uh, tango music is the the most. Uh, a clear picture of us we have here so when do you when do you get into tango you get into yourself because you can just see your grandparents there walking on the street like not listen this music where they didn't have like walkmans in the forest you know like but this music is their sound it, it is the music of the frequency we had at this moment and it is the most Argentinian thing we have uh, as a, how to say, like in a musical way. Uh, at this moment, if you listen to music on, on the 70s, tango started to be something that I feel it is not trying to make a picture of us, uh, like a X-ray of, of, of our culture. You know, Tango is something that you can see it is from another time. If you want to go to 70s and and try to figure how people were in Buenos Aires at this moment, you need to listen to rock and roll. You're not going to listen to tango music. Uh, but tango, it is this picture of Argentina and Buenos Aires from the 40s, from the 30s, from the 50s. You can really see that. And I, I have not just, uh, I mean, my grandfather was a bandoneon player. My, in my mom's side, my, pa my grandparents were milongueros you know like they met in milonga they were dancing tango all their lives not professional but they were milongueros and when i listen juan darienzo i i just i can oh close my eyes and, and see my family you know it is it is us and i found this with juan darienzo and with uh troilo the first years of troilo in the 40s i can just see how we were how we are i can see my grandparents my uncles I, everything you know, it is the way we talk, the way we behave, the way I do this with my hands when I'm talking now without in like instinctively, you know, 
it is this is so Italian, it's so Spanish, it's so there are many things that are mixed in tango music, you know. So uh, when I found tango, I just fell in love because it's in a way like uh, falling in love with yourself, with, with who we are. Uh, it's so important to listen the lyrics, to understand the, the moments, you know, uh, to to go there. Uh, but for us, it's so easy because it's it's how we talk. It's always telling stories about us. Yes. Uh, so um, to go back to the, the, the years that you learned music. So you were able to study for three years, I think, with your grandfather or uh, kind of yeah 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 kind of like two two years and a half three years six seven eight oh yeah maybe more than three years yeah. so and you then you started also working with him rather soon after two years or something i think you said that yeah i started to play with him in his orchestra in 2008 uh, and we played together like about one year until he died because he died like suddenly it was not something that oh okay one day in the hospital and then he died oh right okay uh, so he was working until the last i don't know hmm. two three days of his life he was on the stage uh, and he started to feel not so good so he kept the secret he didn't want to tell anyone uh -huh. so he went to work every day feeling not so good and finally he he went to the hospital and then so uh, during all this time we were working together and after that I started to to play with his musicians in a quartet and the orchestra at the same time uh, and then in 2012 after like four years after my, my grandfather died I I founded La Juan D'Arienzo it was the, the main uh, a goal of La Juan D'Arienzo was to make uh, an orchestra, typical orchestra uh, with young people. I mean, the, the, the main idea was not to, to call like uh, great musicians that were like 70 years old, but to get like 10 musicians with, uh, I don't know, good musicians, but with mm, no long careers, like, uh, I don't know, 25, 28 years old. We were all that age. Uh, and there were a lot of musicians at this moment, and like now. And so we make an orchestra with young people, and it was like crazy for for everyone in the Milongas. It was, it was not normal to see uh, orchestras with young people. So there were some groups, but little groups. But an orchestra, it was like, so so a new thing suddenly, uh, and it was so successful from the beginning. On the list, it was like kind of explosion at the beginning here. Yes. Uh, yeah. 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 Um. So maybe one more question about your learning process. So mm -hmm. I don't really know how to phrase it, but I'm I'm interested in how you got from this stage of like being this beginner to playing professionally rather fast, just within a few years. Like it's a lot of practice. Uh, is there anything else or any interesting anecdotes you can tell about that those times? Yeah. Okay. The first thing I I. I... I'm convinced about that. Like, uh, I was not prepared to do anything of the things I did when I did it. I mean, when I when I when I went to play the very first time with my grandfather, I had to play twelve songs or fourteen songs, and I knew three. I got to stage knowing that I was not going to play. I think eight or nine songs. Because I didn't have any time to study. Uh, it was so another accident in my life. But uh, my grandfather wanted me to rehearse with the orchestra so I could play with some other musicians, you know? So he prepared a rehearsal with the, with the orchestra and we were going to play free songs. Okay, free songs. I studied this a lot and I went to the rehearsal. I played with all the musicians. It was like, wow. You know, it was my very first time I was playing with other people like this. Uh, and the owner of this place called La Ventana, it's, it's a tango house here in, in Argentina for foreign people. The own, it was a Tuesday. 
and the owner said he plays very well. Uh, I want him to start to play on Thursday. And I, I didn't have a suit. I didn't. I had my hair longer, so I had to cut my hair the following day. I had to get a suit and I had to go to work on Thursday without knowing any song. You know, uh, my grandfather said he's not ready to play. On Thursdays he's going to be on the stage. Bye bye, and, and he left. You know, and I on Thursday I was like white on the stage, you know, like so afraid. And the pianist Alfredo Montoya, he told me. Uh, in, in Spanish, you know, I'm trying to translate. He says something like, uh, all the cards are on the table, he say. It means like, there's no way out, way back. You know, you are on the stage. So I I will pay to see my face. I was so afraid about this. But every day I started to play the songs and try to practice, to practice. And after one month or one month I had, I was already playing all the songs. So it was so accidental. And... With La Juan Darienzo, it was similar too, because I was with Ricardo and we were talking like, why we don't make this orchestra? We need young people. We need to bring this to the Milonga. We have to make it and, and trust that this is going to be successful. Uh, and we were three people talking there, drinking a beer uh, before to play with another orchestra. We had a, we were playing at this moment. And, and they say, okay, let's go tonight. We are going to two Milongas. And we are going to say these people, the organizers, that we have an orchestra called La Juan D'Arienzo and, and we are looking for gigs, you know? But we had not, no orchestra, we had just a, a dream, you know? So we started to talk that day and the following day, we had two shows and no orchestra. <laughs> okay. We had two, two shows confirmed and we were three people drinking a beer, you know? So we had to make an orchestra now. Uh, so after one week, we got the musicians, and after two weeks, we had one rehearsal, and after three weeks, we were on the stage with, I don't know, everything was so improvised, and people was like, wow, you know, like, this is amazing, uh, and I was conducting this orchestra from the beginning, I was not ready to do all these things, uh, but every time I, I had the opportunity to, I don't know, to do it, I was brave enough to, to do it, like, conducting or, or playing for the very first time or, uh, I don't know I I, I just did it uh, it is much better if you are prepared you you feel more comfortable <laughs> but uh, but you don't you, you need you don't need to be afraid if if, if the opportunity comes it, it's going to come in the way life wants and, and you have to take it so yes so maybe another uh stupid question but uh, wh why was it so important for you guys to have young people on on board because we had the ambitions of playing uh, in in milongas i mean at this at this moment we were playing with three people we we were playing in a in an orchestra monday to monday like every day of the year in a place for tourist people here you know there are many tango places in argentina buenos aires that the tourist comes with cruisers or, or having holidays here to Argentina, and they go there and they eat some meat and they drink wine and they see a tango show with dancers and musicians live. So this place is open the doors every day, but we didn't want to play anymore there. We wanted to to go to Milonga and give our music Juan D'Arienzo to to dancers because this is why Juan D'Arienzo exists for dancers. So. We wanted to go to play to Milongas. And all the, the, the musicians I was playing with at this moment, the, the musicians that were so old, they didn't want to quit to this job because they had a, a sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, work. yeah. yeah. Uh, it was a salary. It was, I mean, they did. They, they were not expected to make changes in their lives. Oh, yeah, they didn't yeah, have yeah. any ambitious plans, you know. They already played in the whole world during decades, you know. I'm not going to change now. But I was 23, 24, you know, like I really wanted to travel. I really wanted to go everywhere. And I wanted to go to different milongas to play on different stage every night if I could. So this is why we wanted uh, young people because young people are thirsty, you know? Yeah, thirsty, you say? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, thirsty of uh, working, 
knowing places, traveling, uh, being successful, like I'm, like have this energy to to go forward, and not yes. stop. So this is why we we got young people, and at the same time we wanted to break the idea of the tango music. It was something just for uh, old people. Uh, so every everyone has to be young. Uh, and this this picture of us at this moment it was like wow you know there are ten young guys playing tango what is this you know it was not so normal uh, so uh, many people told me musicians that nowadays I have, have their uh, their groups or or they play somewhere they they told me that at this moment they they when they saw La Juan D'Arienzo they thought so you can make an orchestra you know I could. I didn't imagine to make an orchestra because it's it's a lot of people. It's so hard. So, but when we did it, uh, it became like a possible idea. So they started to be a, a lot of young people orchestras, like big orchestras, like ten people, twelve people. It was not normal at this moment. I think it was maybe one, maybe just one. Now they they are like I don't know, ten, fifteen, all with young people. Yes, well, it's good to be a pioneer, right? Kind of, kind of, yeah. Uh, I, I like to think that that we, we open some ideas to other musicians to. To arrive, uh, uh, to to be brave to to follow this these ideas, you know, to make an orchestra or play, uh, some styles like okay, I like Pugliese, you know, let's play Pugliese or Troilo or whatever. So I like to think that La Juan de Rienzo, uh, open a bit the, the way of, of, of these uh, plans. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, one more question, uh, last question about your, your granddad. Um, so in the beginning, he seemed a bit skeptical, but um, do, do you feel like he was uh, was impressed with you in the end that he... he, he like he he appreciated how how his legacy would be inherited by someone instead of just dying out because sometimes music genres they just die out because nobody does anything with it, but with tango it still works now because so there are young people playing it so mm -hmm. it's a bit of a suggestive question I'm not sure if it's even true at all or I'm not sure if you even find it important as a question but it's just what I feel that would be appropriate to ask. My grandfather was a. Uh, he was so I don't know how to say this in English. Like when people is so serious and so you know, like he was, uh, he was a grown person. You know, he was eighty, eighty two years old. So and he was always so serious and so calm and so I don't know how to say. It. He was not someone that was going to to express a lot of feelings. This is what I mean. It was so hard. Uh, but I learned to see, you know, between, I don't know, patterns we have when we talk, when we laugh, this kind of things. I started to knew not just my grandfather, but as I told you, like, I started to be his friend. I started to be his colleague. I started to play every day, Monday to Monday with him during almost one year. And we came back every every day together uh, from the from work to his house. And... Then and then I continued to my house and talking a lot about politics, about religion, about uh, I don't know many things about music, of course. So I started to to find this guy. And it was one day that it was actually the day, uh, because then everything started from from there. Uh, I told you I had I had this rehearsal, uh, that I knew three songs and finally I, I I got a job. You know, okay, my grandfather had a. A tour, little tour, like two weeks. In, I think it was in Holland, 2006, 2005, something like this. It, it was in Holland, uh, in Amsterdam, and some, some little places that he wanted to play there. And so he told me uh, if I could go to the library to make copies of all the music, all the orchestra. So there were like 30 songs for 10 instruments. It was like kind of like a tone of paper I had to copy. You know, and this moment it was not like home, uh, like now you home have your printer and you start to print. You know, it was I had to go to this place to copy everything. I took like five hours copying the music. So I was playing a lot of Bach and a lot of arrangements, 
but I didn't have any music from Juan Darienzo, orchestra Juan Darienzo. So I told the guy in the library, from this song, I want two copies. From this one, just one. From this one, I want two copies. So I started to take music for me. Then I gave all the music back to him and I got like six songs, something like this. So I studied the three songs and after some weeks, I went to his house and I said, Grandpa, I want you to, to listen to this. And I started to play the variations, Juan Darienzo, La Comparsita, Loca, Hotel Victoria, these kind of famous songs. And, and he started to laugh so much. Like, I think it was the, the first time I, I really saw him like happy about what I was playing, you know? Like, and he said this, like, uh, when do you want to start to play with orchestra, you know? Because I was actually playing his music. Oh, come on, you know, I, I'm not ready for that. I'm not ready for that. So after that, uh, that movement I did, <laughs> uh, he he told me he wanted to make a rehearsal with his orchestra so I could play these songs with him. <clears throat> and after the, this rehearsal, I, I was working with him. So uh, I think this, this day when he was laughing, uh, like so happy because I was playing Pariasiones. I think it was the, the, the time he actually directly showed me that he was proud about what I was doing. Uh, then when he died, uh, his colleagues told me that uh, he was always talking about me. You know, he was always saying, no, my, grand, my grandson is playing very good. You know, like I can't believe how he's improving so fast, but he can't play Bach in one year or this kind of thing. Like, showing I was so proud about me but he was not going to say this to me you know but he was talking about this with some colleagues so when I got this uh, I, I felt so you know like touched too because it was so hard for him uh, I think to to show this uh, I don't know tender words or this kind of things he was not this kind of person but but I know he was so proud and I hope he is you know because we were doing so much for, for his music. <laughs> yes. But it's a really special story. I'm glad I, I have the opportunity to record uh, this and that people can hear about this because it's uh, it's just it's really a tango story, but it's not like uh, something you read on Wikipedia. No. It's, it's very personal, but it's also very typical for me of what tango music can do and... and, and yeah yeah it's it's beautiful um so is is there any like why were you playing bach did you did you need like a uh, general musical education apart from just tango to play bach you mean yeah yeah no uh, uh, you need to read music i think just that okay uh, i mean you you can play bardonian is so it's so hard because there there are not many methods for bandonian. No. Every every teacher has his own school, you know. No nobody. There's not like violin or piano that you have like five hundred years of uh, developing schools, and you you can choose your own school. You know, bandonian is something that it's so amateur in this way. Uh, in the last twenty years, it started to change a lot, but and you can find a lot of music written for bandonian actually, but. When I started, it was like two or three books, and then it was piano music. So oh. Bach, it, it is it is so important, and uh, it helps so much for the freedom of both hands. In in Bandonian, you 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 become so good at playing uh, with, if you play Bach. Uh, it helps a lot to recognize the keyboard, <clears throat> to work on different tone tonalities, uh, to um, play different uh, melodies at, at the same time, like. The right and left hand are independent. It is so. So I think in the piano is the same. It is so important for technique too. But in bandoneo, I think it's so so important. Uh, so then I don't know. I think if if someone that plays clave, you know, like perfectly, listen me playing Bach in bandoneo is going to say this is not Bach, you know, or something like this. But uh, as an exercise, it is wonderful. Uh, you came you up. To read music? You came up with that yourself, or was that your uh, grandfather's idea? No, it was he, his idea. He okay, gave okay. This to all, all his students. Ah, uh, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was always like, Bach, Bach, and Bach. 
this was the the his method you know like if you play Bach then you can manage everything so and and I agree actually because <clears throat> you get a lot of technique in with your hands uh, of course there are many things you can play apart from Bach but uh, for technique uh, particularly Bach is amazing so I think everyone is going to re to recommend that because just playing tango music might not be enough to learn uh, I don't know uh, I, I really don't know it's it's not just uh, how to say it like the development of a, of a student I think it has to be uh, it has two parts I mean have fun so you can play tango or <clears throat> everything you like but you need to develop your technique because then you are not going to to improve you're not going to play well you, so if, if you want to actually uh, improve you have to develop the technique and you have to play scales you have to play boring things yeah. you know like scales are, are precious i don't know how to say in english uh, it's the same like, yeah yeah precious like uh, i don't know found all the chords in the keyboard i mean the recognition of the keyboard in bandoni is so important and it is not uh, uh a line like piano or or strings you know like violin you go like from from low to high and you have this line you know yeah and yeah it's a kind of labyrinth you know? yeah yeah so all this technique works for that of course there are there are musicians that in bandonian on any any instrument that they learn to play what they want without any theory without any studio like listen <laughs> but it is not what a teacher is going to tell you, like just enjoy. You know, if if you have if you go with the teacher, they are going to give uh, technique, scales, arpeggios, Bach. Uh, I don't know. Uh, find like there is another book called Hanon for piano. <clears throat> it is so popular for pianists uh, when they are beginners. Uh, it's like this kind of studies, you know, like working on the scales in different tonalities. We were always working with this, and this is so necessary for the instrument. Then you can you can use all this knowledge you have for playing tango or what you want. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because people who are not very familiar with music, they just see you playing on a stage, and they see, oh, yeah. that's that's really like uh, skillful, uh, but they don't really understand how much work goes into actually getting to that stage where you can play so well, right? <laughs> It's like uh, hard work. Yeah, yeah. And for you, there was uh, many days, uh, full time job kind of thing to to eight hours a day, just yeah, to yeah. get uh, to get there. Yeah, it's uh, it's very interesting. Yeah, at the beginning it was like this. Yeah. Um. So you told us that you began with the orchestra. Um. You actually told me before the interview. You told me that you actually uh, have to have the rights to the darienzo name i didn't know it was so uh, formal yeah. can you can you tell me how that happened and what it what it what it what it means when uh when darienzo was <clears throat> in the last uh, years of his life in the 70s <clears throat> he decided to play chess in in television at this moment and he told my grandfather to make it quarter and he did this quarter with two singers with uh, Osvaldo Ramos and Alberto Chavo. And they did a quarter called Los Solistas de Darienzo because Juan Darienzo gave to him the right to use uh, his name. So he could go to, to the rest of the country, different clubs and places, like little towns, playing and bringing Juan Darienzo's music with the original singers and the original musicians from uh, the orchestra. I mean, they were the first bandonion, the piano, the double bass, and the first violin of the original orchestra. They were the solist, you know? So with the two singers, and Alberto Chagui was so loved everywhere he, he went. He was such a loved person. So he started to, to work with the name. Then Juan Darinso died, and his family gave the rights again to my grandfather. Uh, and he was working with Los Solistas de Darinso and Orquesta Juan Darinso. Um, when my grandfather died, uh, 
mas é de, de, de é, owners of the rights. É, I mean, the owner of the right, é, right, it was the wife of his brother because Juan de Linso didn't have any children. So the rights came first to his brother and then to his wife. <clears throat> so I got in touch with this woman because I wanted to make the Juan de Rienzo and we wanted to to have the right to, to use the name. So he he she gave me the, the rights to use the name of Juan de Rienzo to create the orchestra. Yeah, I think it's interesting how that was like a right, like it's it's legally protected. Probably, I never realized that uh, yeah. that it's actually a protected name. It makes sense, right? Yeah, yeah, and it it was really important, and it was a kind of you know at this moment I was so young, so it was huge responsibility I I, I got like, okay, I I I need to to bring this flag as as far as I can, you know, like. This this was so important for me too, a huge challenge, and and I, it's it's so crazy how I see back sometimes and I say, wow, we actually did a lot with the Honda because we played in I don't know how many countries now. We did I don't remember how many tours in around the world, and we recorded a lot of records, you know, and and we are present always everywhere. So uh, I think we we actually gave a lot to this and. And it is paid already. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So how was it like uh, to start uh, doing all these tours? And um, yeah, maybe you should just tell us a bit in general about um, what it takes to, to organize this whole um, orchestra. Because uh, you said before that there's also a lot of management and a lot of different skills that your grandfather yeah. didn't need to have. That yeah. you do because yeah. it's different times. So can can you talk a yeah, bit about yeah. that? We are we are musicians, but but we are managers. We we are communities. We organize the food and the uh, kilometers we had to do with cars and the insurance, uh, health insurance, and everything we had to do for a tour is just managed by by me and, and Ricardo. I mean, we are we have to do everything around. So planning tours is really hard because. We had 10 people. We had to move a lot of people around Europe for 45 days, like maybe 25 or more cities, 10, 11 countries every time we go. Um, so there's a lot to organize. It's not hard. Uh, it's not uh, easy. It's so hard. It's so physically tiring to make tours. Uh, and we have to be so prepared for that. It, it's not, not an easy thing. Um, so... It's not just being uh, a musician. I mean, the music and the stage is the the part that that people see. But behind of this, of course, there is a lot of the lot of shop and organizing tours. Is, it's so hard. I mean, my grandfather didn't have to do this because they had normally like a manager that just do this, you know, uh, like selling the orchestra or talking with organizers or deciding where and what are we going to eat in the afternoon, you know, these kind of things. They were just going to soundcheck and playing. So they had a lot of time to dedicate to music. And, and, and we don't have all this time. Sometimes it, it's impossible uh, not to study some hours, but uh, to, I don't know, play bandonian three hours and then compose like five hours. I don't have this time. I have to do, I, ha I have to send emails today <laughs> to a lot of people that in Europe for the tour. So I'm not going to have this time. So how come you don't have a person like that? Is that just not feasible anymore in these times? A person who does the administration? Yes, every person that uh, it's on the company, you know, <clears throat> it's a person that needs to be paid. And it, it's so hard to be much more people. I mean, we are already 10. And if we want to be, a, it would be a pleasure for us to have like, I don't know, 10 people working for all the organization of La Juan de Lienzo. And, but the 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 budgets are not ready for that. I mean, we we don't we don't have budgets to to have a manager or someone that I don't know make clothes for us or uh, rent a studio to rehearse every week. I mean, we don't have this tango environment. It it's uh, it's so little and it is not so. I mean, it it's so big around the world, but it is not something that you can. Uh, I don't know. 
grow so much. I we were feeling that we touched the roof of of this environment uh, some years ago, and it is really hard to 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 grow. You know, uh, like I don't know to make this company in in, in a way like uh, bigger. It would be amazing, but uh, for now it's impossible. Yes. Uh, but you also told me that it's also the reason why, for example, you learned English, mm. and you, you like um, you told me before the interview that it's also actually challenging you all the time to grow. It's never boring because you need to do so many many things and arrange so yeah, many things. Yeah. You 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 need to. It's a, a, a like what I say at the beginning, like. Uh, I was on the stage, and it's not important how afraid I was. I had to just stay there and play, you know. Uh, and sometimes you have to face a lot of challenges, like yeah, learning new languages, like uh, that. It, I don't know. It's a uh, mandatory because you start to travel and you have a sound check, and and you can't communicate with the people that is uh, the the sound engineers, for example, and and you need to speak English at least. Uh, I started to listen to to study some German years ago. Not enough to to talk, but but I was studying some months, uh, and and it was so necessary because we were going every year to Germany, and and there were a lot of times that we didn't have opportunity to communicate, to have a good sound on the stage and these kind of things. It was so important. Okay, German German was so hard, you know. <laughs> like I need to live there to learn German. I think, uh, but. Uh, English, for example, yeah, it was a necessity for me to to talk to work. Uh, it was so important. But yeah, it it also made you grow in all kinds of ways, like to have all this responsibility yeah. uh, for so many people. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's not just that. I mean, the, the talking with a sound engineer, but everything related to I don't know. Let's say like. Uh, flights or emergencies you can have in a tour yeah you, you have to talk in english i mean you, you are not going to communicate in spanish everywhere so if you are in sweden or germany or england you need to make an emergency call and and you have to speak in english uh, at least at least so uh, it was a necessity but there are a lot of things that uh, we we had to face in these years like Normally, we could do everything very well. Uh, it's just it was just one time when we couldn't fight. It was a pandemic. Uh, we were on a tour in USA, and we were like, uh, I don't know, like escaping from a lot of obstacles to continue with this tour because we needed visas for Canada and we didn't have them, and we had to go to Washington. Uh, I mean, Ricardo fly, uh, flew to Washington to make visas there uh, while I was uh, giving a workshop in, in Texas, you know, and uh, playing there without him. And the following day, we met in somewhere. So we, everyone was traveling around the USA to make fix things. You know, it was so hard. And finally, we got it. And when, when we were in Canada, uh, uh, after this wonderful uh, festival in Montreal, we had to come back to USA, and I told Ricardo, I really think we are unstoppable. You know, like no nothing can can stop us. You know, <clears throat> we can manage everything. It's I can't believe it. And after some days, it, the pandemic started. It was bigger than anything I saw before. Like, okay, we had to come back home. You know, we can do yeah. nothing to this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had to come back uh, rushing because the the borders were going to too close and i remember that to say uh we are unstoppable man and after some days we were changing the tickets <laughs> in los angeles to come back to los angeles yes <laughs> okay this is bigger you know <laughs> yes but, but i think it was the only time we had things to 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 manage uh that we couldn't because it was actually the first tour we did in Europe, Ricardo, we were talking with Ricardo, he said, I have a friend that uh, he's a priest on a church here in Argentina. Maybe I can talk to him because it would be amazing to go to to Rome, to the Vatican and have an interview with the Pope. And and I was listening to him 
like always like okay he's talking seriously you know like yes it would be amazing how can we do it so we need to do this and that okay let's do it you know and and we got it i mean we we got an an, an invitation to go and we gave our we shake hands with the pope in the first tour we did we took a picture you know it was we played some some bandonium to him it was just of course two minutes we were with him we shake hands and say oh argentina you know i love tango what, what do you prefer juan darienzo oh yes juan darienzo juan darienzo so it was he's argentinian so it was really but every time we 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 had dreams it was like yeah let's do it you know? and, and we could i don't know i think we are so unconscious and this is a kind of a positive thing sometimes <laughs> yes 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 so let's use the um... Was there anything else you wanted to add to that? Um, I don't know. I, I just would like to <clears throat> invite all the people to to search and, and listen our music. They they can find everything we do in in Spotify, uh, YouTube, and, and Instagram, Facebook. You can follow us. This is so important for us and listen our music. And we are going to come back to Europe now in May, May and June. We are sharing our shows and gigs everywhere there in in instagram so you, you can find all the information there uh, we are going to play about i don't know how many shows we have like 25 28 shows uh, in about 35 days mm. we're going to visit a lot of cities uh, in germany in in denmark uh, Svaria, uh, sweden uh, we are going to holland too we are going to play in den haag uh, we are going to lisbon tango festival again it's kind of uh, our family festival uh, we go to spain we are going to be in italy and france in switzerland so we are going to do a lot and and if you would like to 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 see our music and dance with our music uh, you are invited well i think people if they listen to this they'll probably be even more motivated to come listen um, because they understand uh, everything that that uh, that's behind something like an orchestra that you can just search on youtube and you can listen to it but they don't know everything that's going on behind it it's uh i think it's very interesting to get this behind the scenes type of view and that's also what i would like to um like the remaining time in the interview i just wanted to focus on on, on one thing um because you said something earlier that i thought was interesting you said like i feel um a certain responsibility for the heritage of darienzo and I've also understood that, like, Darienzo, the sound Darienzo is really your thing. And that's also what you do. So can you talk a bit about um, about this style and, and uh, uh, what it means to you? And, and why is it so, why, why it is so important for the dancers? You know, I, I think I fell in love with, with Juan Darienzo because <clears throat> it, it was the most... It, this is weird, right? But the most rock and roll style of tango when I when I found it, uh, I remember to to listen a lot about a lot of Troilo when when I was young too. Uh, I still do it, of course, but at this moment I I remember to to listen a lot his singers, Troilo singers, they were amazing, and the orchestras were so so complete and so big. But Juan Darienzo, this beat of Juan Darienzo was like something else for me. I, I can just uh, find a kind of vibration there that it is mine, it's my thing. I don't know uh, how to explain it with words. It's, it's a feeling, you know, it's just a feeling that I feel like, this is amazing. You know, it's, 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 it happens with other, uh, uh, and other uh, things like Troilo, Troilo Fiorentino, for example, I really loved it always i really love this music it is this uh i don't know i can make a picture of uh, an ordinary common people guy in the 40s uh moving on the street with this rhythm like uh vibrating on this rhythm it is not the same uh the tango uh, i don't know troilo in the 60s where where i i can listen to a lot of academic development you know with a lot of strings and, and arrangements that are so like, I don't know, symphonic, you know, it is 
crazy. It's amazing. Of course, everyone loves this too. And it is nice to dance it too. But it is not this rhythm thing that, I don't know, it was, I don't know, it was something for common people. And this, this idea of the music of the common people, uh, I, I found this in not, not many styles. Uh, Juan D'Arienzo, Troilo with Fiorentino, but then mm, it started to change a lot. So fast, uh, Tanturi. Tanturi with Campos, Tanturi with Castillo. This is so amazing. Uh, this kind of tango, this uh, danceable and, and, I don't know, in Spanish, or lunfado, we, we are going to say canchero. Canchero means when you are kind of, uh, not arrogant, but uh, when you show off, you know, when you walk like this, like this mafia guys, this kind of things. It, this kind of vibration is this music. And the lyrics are talking always about regular people. I mean, there is not normally like, uh, I don't know, in English, if you say like bl the blueprints, you know, it's always talking about stories that are real for the people. So when the peop when people listen to this, they, they can feel uh, touched because they live the same, like with love, with a, a brother, with my mom, with this kind of things. It is so dramatic. It is so Italian. You know, it is so us. But uh, I think Juan D'Arienzo was uh, in, in the 30s and the 40s, it was like just perfect for this. And then tango became so popular. And then a lot of academic things came to, to tango music to make it better, but to uh, erase a bit this, this mark of common people. So I like everything, but these styles that are so close to the normal common ordinary people I, I really like it a bit more yes and i guess that's what you're still doing so yeah. it has uh, it has survived from the 40s uh and 30s and 50s on to the present day yeah. yeah yes um maybe just one improvised uh question um like Darienzo has many different styles. There's a Darienzo from the late 30s. There's Darienzo from the 40s, and then there's Darienzo uh, in in the, in you know later. So, mm -hmm. are you particularly inspired by one of these eras or not, or do you just play everything? Like it's yeah, a bit uh, of a fake a question. Yeah, we, we play a bit of everything, <clears throat> but not so much about not not so much from 30s it's the the the, the 40s i think is when the, the orchestra found a development uh, sound uh, in this style uh, with salamanca right, in the piano and this this is the sound that i think everyone is going to try to, to play when they play Juan D'Arienzo. and the arrangements are more related to this or to the fifties and sixties, because I, I, I work with the original music of my grandfather. I mean, he had all this music, so uh, the arrangements are from him. And then I wrote new tangos. Uh, La Juan Danisa played some tangos that, that that are mine with lyrics and, and music, and some arrangement or this kind of things. But uh, I, I think since forties, uh, the orchestras started to. To have better sound, better musicians, better, better shit music, you know. <laughs> so, I think forties and the late sixties are the the best for me. The late sixties, maybe with the new technology for recording, the bandonians and the orchestra sounds like explosive. Like I really love it. It's like ah, the the sound is so like compressed. I don't know. It's so so nice. And the forties with Depending with singer, but I don't know, Maure, for example, these kind of things. I don't know. It's so hard to to make something better and more beautiful than this. It's so beautiful. Uh, and Valdez, for example, in in the latest, uh, the, this is crazy. And how they could keep the style in the sixties after all the development of orchestras, it it is so hard. And they they were working a lot to to have like a different kind of singers like romantic singer but at the same time this 
uh, early 30s and 40s singer that talks about teeth and, and knives and this kind of things. So they were, they continue doing everything. They, they didn't change to something mm-hmm. like, okay, tango, it was in the 30s and the 40s, was something a bit like dark and, and you know, border. And in the 50s, every family was dancing tangos in clubs with children. So it was not the same. So everyone started to, to make something more for the whole family. And Juan Lorenzo keep kept this uh, Alberto Echagüe sound with Lufardo and, and uh, Tiffs and this kind of stories that were like people that I don't know have fights on the street, this kind of things that uh, that actually people love to hear at this moment. Uh, like like my grandfather, you know, he always talk about Alberto Echagüe. It was so dumb. Uh, so I, I like the whole thing uh, in Juan Lorenzo, but there are, there are things in the early forties and the late sixties. That for me, I like. Wow, this is crazy! I can't believe it. Yeah. What is your favorite song? Oh, oh, I, I really don't know. I change all the time. <laughs> okay. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I now I I can say uh, bad exposition. I think the version of Juan Darinso is one of these explosive things that I I, I don't know. It, I can't believe it. I think it's so hard to to make this. It's so so nice. But in two weeks, I I, I am in love. Oh, you may so. have another better opinion. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Well, it's uh, I could have asked many more things, um, but um, I think this was an interesting um, conversation with some uh, like uh, specific uh, uh, things we we talked about and. Um, Yes, I'm. I'm happy how it turned out, and uh, yes, I think people uh, will really enjoy this. Um, all this inside information that's in this interview, uh, and that's uh, of course the most interesting part about in, uh, interviewing a musician is that you get to all these insights you don't really uh, read on the internet all the time. Like it's not really very common. It's just yeah, I, I like that. <laughs> It's a, uh, but I think it's the the, the most uh, beautiful things to talk, uh, because all all the things that you can find on, on a stage or I don't know on a movie or a, or a book has a story behind that. It's how this was done, and and, and it is so easy for me to, to to tell this because we have a lot of anecdotes to to tell. So every time I I, I have to talk about the Juan Darien, so this <clears throat> story different kind of things come out and, and it's so beautiful for me too. I really enjoy it. Yes, yes. Uh, so thank you for uh, today and uh, I hope to uh, meet you in person at some point. So uh, let's see uh, how we can make that possible. But it's, uh, yeah, it was really interesting uh, to meet you and uh, well, thanks for the uh, conversation. Oh, no, please. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, and and uh, of course, I, I, I would like to see you when we go to Europe too. Yes. <clears throat>